Well, we are continuing our series today about Jesus is the greatest. Previously, we had talked about him being the greatest prophet and the greatest priest. Today, it's going to be Jesus is the greatest king. And Jesus is greater than the kings. That's also another theme that we're going to explore today. So let's have a quick re recap of everything we've seen so far in this series. We saw that in the Old Testament, there are three offices that were anointed with oil. They were prophet, priest, and king. Jesus, as the Christ or Messiah, is the anointed one holding all three offices. But it's better than that because Jesus not only holds these offices, he fulfills what those offices were intended to point to, and he exceeds them. He's greater than that. So how is that? He, he said so himself in Matthew chapter 12, he says something greater than the temple is here, something greater than Jonah is here, and something greater than Solomon is here. So each of these represents one of those offices. The temple represents the priesthood, Jonah represents all the prophets, and King Solomon represents all the kings. Jesus is saying he's greater than all that. And we're going to see today, we saw a priest already, we saw a prophet already, now we're going to talk about Jesus being greater than the kings. We saw that Jesus fulfills all Old Testament types and shadows. It says in the scripture, these are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ, Colossians 2.17. So everything, these Old Testament types and shadows were pointers to Jesus and what he was going to do. And now they're fulfilled in him at his first ministry or his first advent and in his ministry during that first advent. We saw in the previous lessons that Jesus is greater than the temple. A, he, is, his, he is the presence of God in a greater way. He is the priesthood in a greater way. He's able to make an offering that no priest could ever make, a once-for-all offering. He's a greater sacrifice than any animal sacrifices. They could never take away our, our sins, but Jesus does. He offered this once-for-all sacrifices that cleanses the sins of all people at all times and all Places So greater than the temple and everything that it represents and stands for. Jesus is, Jesus is greater than the prophets. He is the perfect revelation of God, direct and unmediated. All the prophets could do was pass along a message that they got from God. They could never reveal his character, his nature, his behavior, his heart, his love for us. Jesus did that in person because he is God in person. So Jesus is greater than the prophets. Now, we also saw in previous lessons, it was never God's desire that we have these uh, types and shadows instead of the original or instead of the substance. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus states this principle this way, from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, if you want to know what God's ideal conditions are, what his desires are, look at the pre-fall condition back to the beginning of creation before the fall of man. That's the ideal, and that's what we want. Well, ever since Christ's first advent, because of what he did in his life, his ministry, his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Holy Spirit, all these ideals are restored as much as possible. Because we still live in a fallen world that has fallen people in it, that still has sinners in it. So the, the whole world isn't set back to the pre-fall conditions. But within the church, spiritually, we are set back to that conditions. Even we who are saved by, by Jesus, we still have this, the corruption and the stain of sin in our flesh. So again, these things are restored as much as they possibly can, given the conditions that we live in. We had seen previously that the ministry of Jesus continues in his body, the church. So we are the body of Christ, and we continue his priesthood that makes us a royal priesthood as it says in several places in the scripture we are a kingdom of priests his prophethood continues in us not by the the way that we receive a revelation and say thus saith the lord but we share the christ that we know with people he is the perfect revelation we just tell people about him we share the one the gospel that was once for all delivered to the saints it's not a new revelation it's a finished up completed, fulfilled in Christ revelation, and that's what we share with others. And in, do, in doing that, we continue the prophethood that Jesus began. We hold to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and share it with others. That makes us prophets, I mean, 
in the sense that we're carrying on his prophethood. And we're going to see that the same thing is true of kingship. We're going to see that in, an, in a future lesson in this series. Dr. Beale, I showed you this quote. He says, the people of God have no other destiny during the church age than that of the lamb during his earthly ministry. And this is why this book of Revelation says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. We are retracing Jesus's path. He did his ministry. We do his ministry. He was rejected by the world and hated by the world system. We also will be rejected and hated. He suffered. He died and was buried, but he was resurrected and ascended into heaven. We who follow the lamb wherever he goes will retrace these steps. We also must suffer and we will die and be buried, but we will also be resurrected and ascend into heaven. We follow the lamb wherever he goes. Great uh, comment there from Dr. Beale. So Jesus is the greatest king. And all these principles that we've seen in the previous uh, lessons about prophets and priests will also be true of his kingship. However, it's not just going to be a retread of the things we saw before, because it's very interesting, the, the uh, passages in the scripture that we need to go to to demonstrate this. It's, you know, each of these offices has a different uh, background and, and, and creates a different environment. So it's, it's wholly uh, interesting and very fascinating. I have found it to be as I studied this. All right, so while we're doing that, we'll also be answering a misconception. So I'll be explaining how Jesus is the greatest king, and he is greater than the kings, but I also want to answer this misconception that's found a false teaching that's gotten into the church, an unsound doctrine regarding the kingship of Jesus. And the way it's, uh, you know, different people have different ways of saying this, but it's essentially amounts to Jesus is not fully king now in some way. Perhaps they'll say he's not king of Israel or king of the Jews. They might acknowledge that he's perhaps king of the church, but he hasn't yet set up a kingdom on earth and he will come at his second coming. And at that time, that's when he'll set up his kingdom. They may make a distinction among several different kingdoms. Some of them distinguish between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Those are different kingdoms to these people. And some of them will teach that there's a kingdom of David. That is the nation of Israel. There's a kingdom. There's a millennial kingdom. And these are all different kingdoms. Three, four, <laughs> depends on the person. But, you know, all of this is unsound doctrine. It disagrees with scripture. And that's what we're going to see today, in addition to seeing that Jesus is the great king. So we'll be also refuting this misconception and helping you, you know, see that it's scripturally unsound. Okay, so I want to show you a, a quotation from an evangelical scholar who teaches this um, false teaching that I was just telling you about. And you'll just so you can get an idea what I mean. He says this, one day Jesus will literally be king over his people. So you see, if one day, that means it hasn't happened, that he is not king now. He is not king of his people. And this uh, theologian whose name I withheld in face because, you know, I, I, my, my goal is not to embarrass people, but uh, this is a popular, well-known, highly credentialed, published uh, uh, theologian, popular evangelical and he's, this is written in his systematic theology. So if you doubt me, I can show you privately. I'll, I'll show you in his, uh, in his uh, writings that he actually said this. But, um, you know, it's not important who or where, except to know that this is something that we've, we find and it shouldn't be being taught. And that's what I want to uh, re refute today. So here's how we were going to proceed to demonstrate that Jesus is the greatest king. Step one, we'll show from scripture. Jesus is fully king now and forever. Step two will show that he fulfills and exceeds the Old Testament kingship role. Step three will show that we were never meant to have human kings anyway. Step four will answer this question. When did Jesus set up his kingdom? Did it happen already or are we waiting for him to come and set it up in the future? And then step five, how is it that the church participates in the kingdom of Christ? So those are the five steps, and we're not going to get it all done today. We're only going to do part of it, and then we'll do the rest in a future lesson. All right, so step one is to demonstrate from the scripture that Jesus is fully king now and forever. He's not lacking anything in his kingship. We're not waiting for him to come and become uh, king over his people. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to show you a series of evidences and the scriptures to back it up that show that Jesus is fully king. So the first is he was king at his birth in Matthew chapter 2. The wise men come to King Herod asking about Jesus. It says in verse 1, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So they say he was born king of the Jews. At his birth, he is the king of the Jews. And where did they get this idea and, and, and the notion of the star? Well, from the prophecy in Numbers 24. Now, I talked about all this in my eschatology series, which is up on YouTube on the Solid Food Bible channel. If you want to go watch that, you can see a lot more in depth about the, the prophecies of the coming king that have been fulfilled in Christ. But this uh, shows that he was king at his birth. Now, the other thing that we find is that our Christmas carols affirm this. Um, think about the little drummer boy. Come, they told me, pa rum pa pum pum a newborn king to see, pa rum pa pum pum Wait a second. A newborn king? That's right. A newborn is king. Or how about this one? Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Oh, there he is again. The newborn king. A newborn baby. I mean, imagine a little baby and saying he's the king. Well, of course, we don't get our theology from Christmas carols, but the writers of the Christmas carols got their theology from the Bible. And for hundreds of years, people have been uh, have been singing these songs. You know, if they were teaching some bad doctrine, we really ought to get rid of the songs and stop singing them. But, but they don't because it's true. I mean, it, it is an accurate reflection of the biblical uh, evidence that I just showed you. All right, so that was one evidence. The next one is this. He was king in his ministry, and the kingdom was present at that time. So let's go to the scripture. In John chapter 1, verse 49, uh, the Philip, who will be an apostle of Jesus, finds his, his friend Nathaniel and takes him to meet Jesus. And uh, Philip meets Jesus uh, or meets Nathaniel under a fig tree to tell him about this. So they go to, to um, Jesus, and Jesus says to Nathaniel, Oh, yeah, I saw you under the fig tree, you know, Jesus wasn't there physically present. And it says this in, in verse 49, Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. So Nathanael says to Jesus, you must be the king of Israel. And Jesus doesn't object to this. He doesn't say, don't call me that. If Jesus is the truth, as he said of himself, he can't allow people to go around telling lies. And several times he corrects people. So the fact that he didn't object when Nathaniel said he is the king of Israel tells us that Jesus was agreeing. Yes, I am the king of Israel. He even says he's even surprised that Nathaniel is already believing. He says, that's it, that little tiny miracle? You haven't seen me raise the dead or walk on water or, or control the weather by talking to it or make bread out of nothing. You know, all, you need, all Nathaniel needed was this little evidence, and he was ready to acknowledge the kingship of Jesus, and Jesus did not deny it. So Jesus is king in his ministry. In Matthew chapter 12, he says, uh, you know, he's casting out demons, and they say, oh, he must be doing it by by devils or by the power of satan but jesus says but if it is by the spirit of god that i cast out demons then the kingdom of god has come upon you well obviously if you're a christian you're going to say it was by the power of god and not by the power of the enemy that jesus was casting out these demons well as a result then the kingdom of god had come upon them at that time the kingdom was present in the person of jesus so he was king in his ministry and it, the kingdom was present in Luke 17, 20, it says this of Jesus, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. 
So Jesus says the kingdom is here. It's, it's among you, right? Of course, Jesus being the king, the, the kingdom is present in his person. So the kingdom was there at that time. All right, so we've seen those two evidences. What's next? The baptism of Jesus was his anointing. As I said, kings in the Old Testament were anointed. So this was the point, point at which Jesus was anointed as the king of Israel and as king of the kingdom. At his, uh, at his baptism, the Holy Spirit comes down on him like a dove. Now, in the, in the anointing, they would pour oil on your head, right? So it comes down over you. This is how the Spirit came upon him, just like an anointing. And elsewhere, the scripture tells us that all of us who are Christians have been anointed by the Spirit. So we know that receiving the Spirit is an anointing. Jesus receives the Spirit as his baptism. That's an anointing. Back to Peter Walker's book, he says this, from the outset, the reader is being prepared for Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Mark's description of Jesus' baptism a few verses later makes the same point. For when the divine voice declares, you are my son, this echoes Psalm 2-7. He said to me, you are my son, today I have become your father. The immediately preceding verses of that psalm had been concerned with the theme of the Davidic kingship in Jerusalem. And then he quotes part of the psalm. Although it took place in the River Jordan, Mark indicates that Jesus' baptism was his enthronement as the true Davidic king over Jerusalem. The king has been anointed in the desert. Now, he, he uses a very strong word with enthronement. Um, he doesn't actually sit on a throne at that point, but I understand that he's saying that this is his appointment. He's officially the king of Israel the, uh, he is king at that time. He is anointed, as I was saying, at his baptism. So that's an evidence of his full kingship. All right, what else? After his resurrection, he was enthroned. He did sit on the throne of God in heaven. Let's see that in the scripture. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So after making purifications of for sins, that was the cross and his resurrection. After that, that's when he sat down on the throne of God. That was his enthronement. He says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, okay, this is written to the church in Laodicea. And it, that's a first century church. The, the book of Revelation is written sometime in the latter half of the first century AD. So he's talking to a church that was there presently, and he says this. This is Jesus speaking. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Notice this, conquered and sat, both are past tense. He already conquered at the cross. He triumphed over the enemy and over sin and death. And he sat down with his father on the throne, as it says in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, verse 3 that we just read. He sat down at the right hand. He sat on his father's throne. So his, he was enthroned in the first century after his resurrection. So he is king now. He remains seated on God's throne. And he was king then at that time. All right, what else do we have? He was acknowledged as king by his first disciples. When in, uh, we're going to go to Acts chapter 17. Uh, Paul and Barnabas go to Thessalonica. And they're preaching the gospel, and there are other brothers there. One of them is named Jason, who's received him. Jason is a local boy. And the, the crowd, the mob, goes looking for these two guys to drag him before the city authorities. They can't find Paul and Barnabas, so they grab Jason and some of the other Christian brothers there. And this is what happens next. They, they, they bring them to the city authorities, trying to accuse them of a crime, and they, they say this. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So the accusation that's hurled against the first century Christians is they're following another king like Caesar, a king who has dominion over you know, most of the earth. King, <laughs> king Caesar had a, quite a, a large dominion. They're not just talking about a king in the little tiny place of Israel. They're talking to someone on the level of, of, of Caesar. They're, 
you know, the accusation brought against them is that they are following another king. So, uh, you know, this, this is enemy testimony. This is not from the Christians. The Christians didn't write this. This is an accusation that's made against them. So this is powerful evidence that they had another king. The first apostles, disciples of Jesus were preaching another king. And this gospel that they brought, Turn the world upside down. By the way, that's what the gospel is supposed to do. It's supposed to turn the world upside down. And that's what we should be uh, about doing. All right. So we've seen he was king at his birth. He was king in his ministry. His baptism was anointing as king. He was enthroned after resurrection. He was acknowledged as king for, by his first disciples. Also, he reigns from heaven with all authority, just like a king should. Where do we find that? Well, Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus says, after his resurrection, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. In Ephesians 1.20, it talks about the mighty work God did, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So any authority or power or rule that you can think of, Jesus is higher than that. He has all authority, as he said in Matthew 28. Now, both now and in the future, and he is, once again, it says he's seated at the right hand of God. So enthroned in heaven. And in Revelation 1, verse 5, again, this is the, this is the prologue. This is not something about the future. It says, uh, this is John uh, speaking, his doxology. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. So he says he is, Jesus is, at that time again, latter half of the first century AD, he is ruler of kings on earth. So whatever kings there are, whatever rulers there are, Jesus rules over them. He has greater authority, and he has kingship over the whole earth. All authority on in heaven and on earth. Okay. And the length of his reign, what is the length of his reign? Maybe it ended, right? Maybe he had it in the first century, but sometime after that, it ended. No, the scripture tells us Christ reigns forever. Where do we find that? Well, let's go to the scripture. In Luke chapter 1, verse 31, the angel comes to Mary, the, who will be the mother of Jesus, and says this, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So, <laughs> could it have ended? No. The angel says in the scriptures, there will be no end to his kingdom. In 2 Samuel 7, 12, Sam, uh, King David receives the, the, uh, the Davidic covenant, and this is God speaking through his prophet. God says to, to David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this is not talking about Solomon. Solomon didn't do all the things that God said that uh, the son of David would do. Uh, this is talking about Jesus. And what is the length of his throne and his kingdom? It's forever, which agrees with the other scriptures. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8, of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. So the throne, which represents his sovereignty, his kingship, is forever. And this is a quotation from Psalm 45, verse 6, which also says forever and ever. So we see there is no end forever, forever and ever. It's very clear that his reign lasts forever and it does not end. And I could show you more of these verses in each of these categories, uh, including more verses that say his reign is forever. In fact, there is not a single verse in scripture that says his reign is less than forever. Now, those who uh, hold this uh, unsound doctrine that I was talking about, as an objection, they say, well, in Revelation 20, it says the reign of Christ is only 1,000 years. Isn't that what it says? 
Well, no, I actually dealt with this in my eschatology series in uh, episodes 12 and 13, which are about the thousand years in Revelation 20. And I'll just briefly summarize it. it it's this, go and read the passage. It does not say Christ reigned for a thousand years. It says they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So it is they, the saints, who have the thousand years. It, it doesn't say anything about the length of reign of Christ. And everything else is in the scripture tells us the length of his reign is forever. Now, in, in that previous lesson, I was talking about the kingdom. This time I'm talking about the kingship. So there's a lot to say about the kingdom of God in, in the Bible. And that's why um, this is a great lesson because it dovetails nicely with that other one. If you want to know more about the kingdom and the thousand years, you can, you can watch that. If you want to know about the kingship, we have this now going on. All right, so all these evidences, and Jesus never had any of his kingship stripped away. I mean, what power could take away his kingship? He is God. He is the all-powerful, all-knowing being. No, no one could strip his power away. Uh, the, the enemy, Satan, couldn't do it. Men can't do it. You know, in this false teaching, they say that Jesus brought a kingdom and offered it to the people. And they said, no, no, no. Uh, and, you know, God had intended to set up the kingdom, but because these people refused, the, the will of God was thwarted. Well, that can't happen. God's will isn't thwarted by people. We're not more powerful than God. So that doesn't work out. So he never lost any of his kingship. And Jesus is the rightful king, even if people deny that it's true. And think about in the Old Testament, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, the prophet goes to King Saul and says, God has taken your kingdom away from you. you you're no longer king. In the next chapter, uh, chapter 16, he goes and anoints David with oil as the king of Israel. Now, at that moment, David is officially the rightful king of Israel, and Saul is a usurper. Now, if Saul had done the right thing and obeyed God, he could have, you know, trained up uh, David to be his replacement and had a, a, a peaceful transfer of power. But Saul didn't do that. I mean, that's the whole reason he lost it, because he wasn't obeying God. He hunted David down and sent people out to kill him, tried to kill him several times. But eventually, David became king. But all that time, even when he was running around in the desert, uh, looking for allies, uh, ducking and hiding in caves, David was the rightful king because God had made him the king. So even if people deny that Jesus is the king, whether they call themselves Christians or not, he's still king. It's just the way that God is the judge of, of unbelievers. Even though they, they deny him as their judge, on judgment day, they will have to stand before him. And it doesn't matter whether you deny him or, or not, he's still your judge. And Jesus is still our king. All right. His reign is now and continuing, and even the scripture says that. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about the end of time, and he says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now, the word must here is the important one. In the Greek, it's in the present tense. And this is the controlling verb. Reign is, in, is an infinitive. Now, the present tense in, yeah, I, I can't explain that now. Uh, you need to know grammar. But that's what, you know, that's why we look into the Greek text and the Greek grammar to, to, under, to get, you know, more nuance from the text. The uh, present tense in Greek has the primary um, meaning of verbal aspect, and the aspect is continuous. So something that's continually happening now. So if we were to translate this, taking into account that grammar into, into English to, to pull out the subtly, it could say this, for he must continue to reign until he has put all his enemies under his foot feet. That's what it means. And so to say he must continue means he's already uh, reigning and he will continue until the end, right? He, he, he will. He will continue to, to reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So even the scripture is saying his reign at that time, you know, this was written after the cross. This is written in around the 50s AD. And he is reigning at that time and he will continue to reign according to the scripture. So there is no end to it. All right. So here are the evidences that Jesus is king now and forever, fully king and not diminished in any way. 
10 evidences plus one bonus. He was king at his birth. He was king in his ministry and the kingdom was present. His baptism was an anointing as king and prophet and priest, by the way. He was enthroned as king after his resurrection. He is acknowledged as king by his first disciples. He reigns from heaven far above all other rules and authorities. He has all authority in heaven and on earth as a king should. He reign, the length of his reign is forever. It never ends. He never had any of his kingship stripped away because there's no power that can do that. And he is the rightful king, even if people deny him. His reign is now and continues. All this I've just demonstrated to you from the scripture. So we can say conclusively that the Bible teaches Jesus is king now and forever. And he's fully king, not diminished in any way. All right. So coming back to this objection or this false uh, doctrine that I was talking about, one of the things that they might say is that while he could be king of the church or king of the creation, he's not the king of Israel, not the king of the, the historic nation that was there in the Old Testament, the kingdom of, of David. So let's see if that's true. Let's consult the scripture again and test all things, hold fast to what is good. Well, when we go to the book of Revelation, once again, in chapter 3, verse 7, now he's talking to the church in Philadelphia. He says this, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. So this is Jesus speaking to the first century church in the first century when that book was written, the latter half of the first century AD. And he says of himself that he has the key of David. Now, key is a symbol that represents authority. He can open and no one will shut, or we would say unlock and lock, and no one can lock or unlock what he's done because he has that authority. Well, the key of David is the authority over the kingdom of David, right? David was the king of Israel. He had the authority. And now Jesus says, I have that key. This is also a quotation from the Old Testament, from Isaiah chapter 22. And the prophet is giving this message to the man, Shevna, who is the steward of the kingdom, right? Hezekiah is king at this time. But Shevna is like his prime minister, the right-hand man, the executor of the king's will. He has almost complete authority in, in the, the kingdom. And this is what the prophet is told. I, the prophet Isaiah is given uh, something to say to this prime minister guy. He says this in verse 19. I will thrust you from your office and you will be pulled down from your station. In that day, I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and will bind your sash on him and will commit your authority to his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open. So this is the quotation that Jesus has borrowed from as context to, to the, uh, explain to the, ch to the churches that he has all the authority of the, the nation of Israel. Notice here that it's, it says, in speaking of the key of the house of David in, in Isaiah 22, this is your authority. So that authority that he has is represented by the key, the authority over the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, I have that key also. And if you wonder, well, why didn't, you know, why didn't uh, Jesus use maybe a line from a king rather than a prime minister, a, a steward? Well, then that leaves room for God the Father to be king and Jesus to be his right-hand man, the executor who sits at his right hand. So it still works out that he has all authority. Dr. Mulholland, in his commentary in the book of Revelation, says, Jesus then told them that he had the key of David which indicates that God had transferred the control of the house of David to Jesus. And that house of David is Israel. So yes, Jesus is king over Israel. Dr. Beale says this in his commentary on that particular passage. The point of this is that whereas once Eliakim ruled over Israel, now Christ, of whom Eliakim is a prophetic type, rules over the church, the true Israel. So he's basically saying that we, what we learn from the Old Testament is that the key represents the authority 
the rulership of over Israel. Now, he also points out that Israel has been somewhat transformed in the New Testament uh, perspective. And I would agree with that. I would just quibble over one point. I would say that Jesus is the true Israel and that the church is the new Israel because we are in Christ, who is the true Israel. I, I suspect Dr. Beale would probably even agree with that if I could sit down and talk to him. All right. So there was this objection that, that Jesus is not the king of Israel, but we've seen now from the scripture, yes, he is. He has the key of David. That is kingship of Israel. Can't have the key of David and have less authority than King David did. David was the king of Israel. And when Jesus says a greater than Solomon is here, uh, speaking of himself, that he's greater than Solomon, well, what is Solomon known for? Solomon is the king of Israel. Everybody knows that. So you can't be greater than Solomon if you don't even have the kingship of Israel. So we can be certain from the scripture, Jesus is also king of Israel. Now, this false teaching, this unsound doctrine that I've been refuting, says that, well, to explain all this, they say that Jesus came and he offered a kingdom to the Jews, to the nation of Israel, and they refuse it. This is called postponement theory. So as a result of the people refusing to accept the kingdom, God had to put it on hold and is going to wait until Jesus comes back. And, and then that, that's when the kingdom will be set up. You know, as the quotation I read you from that evangelical scholar who shall not be named, it said one day he will be king over his people. And then so according to this teaching, the church is put in place as a, in, as a parenthesis, right? As a kind of afterthought, the, not the primary intention, but just a placeholder until the, the, the real better thing comes along. Well, what do, we, what do we, you know, how do we evaluate this according to scripture? It uh, doesn't hold up very well. Here's what we find instead. After the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter 6, verse 14, we, we find this. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So the people were ready to make him their king. If he really was there to offer them a kingdom, you know, here they are, they're ready to accept. But it's Jesus who walked away from this. Here's what Peter Walker says in his book on, uh, regarding this. Jesus says that his kingdom is not from this world. Thus, when the crowds wish to make him king, he withdraws. And when they hail him as the king of Israel, he deliberately takes a donkey to counter any false notions of what that kingship means. Jesus is indeed the king of Israel and the king of the Jews, but precisely because he is rejected as king by his own people, his kingdom proves to be of a quite different kind. Okay, great stuff. Lots of good things in this quotation. He, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. That's the problem with the, the people wanted to make him king in a worldly way. They had very fleshly desires and outcomes that they were looking for. They wanted a king who would raise an army and throw off the Romans and punish them and oppress them and, and, and steal back the land and all the you know, treasures and make them rich. This is what they wanted in a king. And Jesus essentially refused them. So it says here, uh, Walker again says, he is certainly the king of Israel and the king of the Jews, but his kingdom is of, of a different kind. So he's making the same point. So the idea that Jesus came and offered a kingdom to Israel and they refused is refuted by these scriptures. In fact, what it says is Jesus refused their offer. The people wanted to make him a king in the sense that they meant, and Jesus ran away from that. He said, no, 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 not going to do that. His kingdom is a, of a different kind, not from the world. And of course, we also notice there's only one kingdom of God. I was telling you that these teachers will say there's maybe there's three, four different kingdoms, but no, there's only one kingdom of God. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of the world. He, not one of my kingdoms, you know, and, and it's always the kingdom. There's never you know, multiple kingdoms. We never see that in the scripture. It's never, oh, one of my kingdoms is like this, but the other kingdom will be like this, or one of them's here, but the other one will be there later. No, there's one kingdom because God is a unity. God is a uniter, not a divider. People are always trying to divide up God or, or divide up the, the scripture, but that's wrong headed. And it's not what the scripture teaches. God brings things into unity. He, he breaks down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile and between us and him. God 
is in, united in himself, three persons, but they are united in, in Godhood. So the kingdom of God is one kingdom. It is the ultimate united kingdom, not, not, but it has several aspects, right? There are different aspects of the one kingdom, but there aren't, um, there aren't many kingdoms. All right, so one more thing to add to this, and that's regarding the nature of the word Christ, which is a title. Anyone who says Christ is acknowledging him as king of Israel because that's what the word Christ means. It, the, the, we understand this title because of the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it says there's a coming king, the anointed one, the Messiah or Christ. So it's, you know, let me show you that uh, fr from the scripture. In Luke 23, verse 1, this is when they uh, come to accuse Jesus. It says, then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So these are the enemies of Jesus who are bringing him to Pontius Pilate to accuse him. And what do they say? He's calling himself Christ. And by the way, because they're explaining this to Pontius Pilate, who's a Roman, they say to be Christ is a king. You know, Christ is king. They're practically synonymous as even his enemies acknowledge. So here again, we have enemy testimony affirming that to say Christ is to say king. So what's ironic is these people who would say, oh, uh, you know, Christ hasn't set up his kingdom yet or Christ is not yet king. Well, in saying Christ, they're acknowledging that he's king because that's what the word means. So it's kind of self-refuting. It's, and it's, it's mildly amusing that they say Christ without realizing that that makes him king. All right, so now I was talking about the Old Testament context. And that brings us to step two, to show that Jesus fulfills and exceeds the Old Testament kingship role. So we finished with step one, to establish from the scripture, Jesus is fully king now and forever. All right, having laid that foundation, we can go back and look at the Old Testament and see how Christ is the substance of these types and shadows how all the promises of God find their yes in him, 2 Corinthians 1.20. Well, I talked about the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Jesus is told the forever king will be the son of David, his son. And it wasn't Solomon. Solomon made a mess of things. Solomon divided up the kingdom, and he was an idolater, and he had all these wives. He was a lawbreaker. No, not Solomon. It's talking about the Messiah Christ. And even after even after Solomon, even after the kingdom uh, uh, was destroyed and the people were taken in captivity to Babylon, there were prophets of God authenticated by miracles who were still talking about the coming Messiah, the coming king, the son of David is still coming. So the people could know by their prophets that that prophecy, the, the Davidic covenant given to King David was not about Solomon. It's about the coming one. And that's why the Jews were waiting for this son of David, right? When Jesus showed up, they're like, is this the one? Is he the son of David? You remember when uh, Philip and brought Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel was convinced. He's like, this is the guy. He's the son of David. He's the king of Israel. I can tell how, because Nathaniel knows his Old Testament. Unlike uh, uh, too many people today. So this Messiah that they were waiting for is Jesus. He is the son of David. He has the key of David. He fulfills that Old Testament um, passage about kingship. Well, there are other passages in the Old Testament that talk about his kingship. And one of them is Psalm 2. I want to read you the entire Psalm. It's very short. It goes like this. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. 
Now, to understand this psalm, you need to uh, pull out the characters that are in it. First, we have the kings or rulers and the people, and then opposed to them, or they're opposing God and his anointed, this anointed, that is the Christ. So these are the four principal players in the narrative, and that's the context as you continue reading. So when God says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, that is the anointed or Christ who is the king that God has set. And when the, the writer says, I will tell of the decree, God said to me, you are my son today, that is the Christ speaking, the anointed one. And it says to the kings and the, the peoples, kiss the son, that is make obeisance to him. And you will uh, only be saved if you take refuge in him. So all this is about the Messiah. It's the Christ. It's about Jesus. And he fulfills this passage, Psalm chapter 2. Well, where does this fulfillment take place? Because we have in there a kind of a time word, today. What is that today when the king is set on Zion, when he is begotten uh, and, and God becomes the father? Well, we actually have a passage in the Bible that describes this, and that's in Acts chapter 13, when Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia, that's in the re region called Galatea, from which the book of Galatians is written to these people. Paul goes and, and uh, speaks to the people and tells them the story of Jesus and how he was you know, crucified and then laid in a tomb, and then he gets to this part in verse 30. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead. So the context of this passage is the raising of Jesus from the dead. Notice these parts that I've highlighted here. Raised him from the dead, raising Jesus, and raised him from the dead. That is the today, according to Paul, that was spoken of in Psalm 2. Notice it says here, he has fulfilled the second psalm. It's talking about that psalm and saying that today is the resurrection of Jesus. That was the day the psalm is fulfilled. That was the day God set his king on Zion, his holy hill. This is when Jesus is appointed king also. Yet, yet another, and it's a fulfillment of the Old Testament, and it makes Jesus, it confirms that he is the king. Here's another Old Testament passage that Jesus fulfills regarding the kingship. In Ezekiel 34, God says through his prophet, I will rescue my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep, and I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I am the Lord, I have spoken. And then he talks about the covenant of peace. Now, Ezekiel is writing in the 500s BC, but David was king in the 900s BC. David has been dead for 400 years. So he's talking about my servant, David. Well, this is not talking about the original David. This is talking about the son of David, who will be the shepherd of God's people and their prince or ruler or king. And Jesus is that one. He is the good shepherd, as he says of himself. And in Ezekiel 37, God also says, my servant David shall be king over them and they shall all have one shepherd. Jesus is that one good shepherd, our shepherd, and so he is king. Now, there's many other passages I could show you in the, in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfills in regard to the kingship. I talked about a lot of them in my eschatology series, but that just demonstrates that he fulfills the Old Testament kingship role. But also, he exceeds the Old Testament kingship role and what human kings could do, as he says himself. A greater than Solomon is here, Matthew 12, 42. And he has all authority in heaven and on earth. None of the kings, the human kings, had authority in heaven. None of them ever had authority over all the earth as or were ruler of the kings on earth, Revelation 1, 5. And it says in Romans 4, 13, the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come by the law, but by the righteousness of faith. Jesus is that offspring. He is the one who has inherited the world. He sits on God's throne and reigns from heaven over all creation. No human king 
could do that. So Jesus, as our king, exceeds what human kings could do. He has more power, and therefore he's able to do things that human kings can't. Now, a human king could raise up an army and go attack your enemies, and, and maybe you know if he's, he's good and his army is good, he might defeat them. But he can only do that to physical enemies. Jesus defeats the enemies that we can't do ourselves. He, he defeats death and Satan, and, our, and our, he frees us from sin. Human kings can't do that. So he exceeds the capabilities of those kings, and he does things that no king could ever do. He is the perfect king because he's sinless, and he's all-powerful and all-knowing and all-good. He will never lead us astray. Remember, I was saying Solomon was an idolatry. He caused the kingdom to be divided and destroyed. David, David did a census, and as a result, plagues came on the people. The people had to suffer and die. Many people died from these plagues because of David's, you know, bad mistake. And, but Jesus will never do that. Jesus will never bring plagues on us. So he is a much greater king. He exceeds the Old Testament kingship role. And it's a wonderful thing to, to remember that. And when we consider the essentials of a, a, of a godly king, he should lead by example. Jesus does that. He should protect and save. That's what kings do. But Jesus does it in a greater way. He should intercede with God. No one can intercede with God like Jesus who is the God-man, you know, he is the only mediator between God and men. He's the perfect mediator because he is God and man both. He fights our battles. He leads us in warfare, but not physical warfare, spiritual warfare. He himself single-handedly defeated our greatest enemies, sin and death and Satan. And he empowers us by the spirit to continue the ministry that he, he had. So Jesus far exceeds any human king, the greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is the greatest king, and he's greater than any king. And that's the point of this message. All right, uh, let me have a quote here from my expert panel. Peter Walker says this, This prophetic background made it plain that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem in humility and not with political force of arms. It also revealed Jesus' claim to be the true king of Zion and Jerusalem. Yet who really was Zion's true king? When it is remembered that part of Israel's hope was precisely that after the departure of the Shekinah, presence from Jerusalem at the time of the exile, God himself would again return to Zion and take up residence as her rightful king, the enormity of Jesus' claim becomes apparent. What he's saying is the enormity of the claim is that Jesus is claiming to be God as well as king because the Old Testament prophecies, some of the ones I was just reading, said God himself would be the shepherd but his servant David would be the shepherd. Well, that means that the king, the servant, or yeah, the David servant is God. So even the Old Testament was telling us that the king would be God, and in, in Christ, that is fulfilled. So he, you know, fulfills and exceeds those Old Testament prophecies. All right, that's all we have time for today, steps one and step two. So now I just want to uh, conclude by summarizing what we've, what we've seen and finishing up. Now, I mentioned that there was a false teaching, an unsound doctrine that says Jesus is not fully king. Um, but unlike in the previous lessons, when we saw that there are people who want to go back to having priests and people who want to go back to having prophets and, and building temples, there's no church that I know of that wants a human king to be their Davidic king in place of Jesus. So at least we don't have to deal with that um, unsound teaching. But we still have the one that says he's not fully king. Well, what's so bad about that then? Uh, this false teaching that he's not fully king? Well, it denigrates Christ. It says that he is less than he is. It says that he has done less than he has done. In fact, most of the heresies that we have do this. They disparage Christ in some way, saying of him that he's less than what he is. For example, the Arian heresy that was dealt with at the Council of Nicaea. They said that Jesus is less than fully divine. He's not as much God as the Father is God. He's a created being. He's a, a, a lesser God, for example. We still have people uh, promoting that heresy, the Jehovah's Witness organization, the Watchtower Society, still says that, says of Jesus less than he is. It denigrates Christ, and that's a, that's a problem. That's a heresy. There was another heresy called docetism, which acknowledged his full deity, right? He says he's fully God. But it said he was less than human. He was not human at all. He never became human. Well, that's to say of him less than he is, that he did less than he did. He, it's saying that he did not become incarnate. He is not the God-man. He is not our kinsman redeemer because he never became our kinsman. 
that also was considered a heresy. And most heresies say something wrong about Jesus. I want to show you another quote from someone who maintains this false teaching that I, I've been debunking today, along with showing how Jesus is our king, because it's uh, very illustrative of the problems that I'm having. This one who's a seminary teacher, again, I'm withholding the name and face. He says this, I believe that there's going to be a messianic kingdom of a thousand years where Messiah Jesus is going to reign upon the earth for a thousand years, sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and he will be the perfect king slash priest over that kingdom for a thousand years. Now, what's wrong with this statement based on everything I've just showed you? Almost every phrase in this is wrong. He says there's going to be, meaning in the future, a messianic kingdom. No, the Messiah is here. The kingdom is here. It was present in that day. Of a thousand years, he says it three times, a thousand years, a thousand years. No, it's forever. The kingdom of Christ is forever. And that he's going to reign upon the earth. Well, he doesn't have to be on the earth to reign over the earth. He reigns from heaven over the earth and sitting on the throne of David in Jerusalem. He has the key of David. That's all the authority. He doesn't have to sit in a chair. We don't even have a throne chair for David anyway. And he will be the perfect king or priest. Will be, future tense. Wrong. He is the, the perfect king now and our perfect high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. These things are already true. So you see, almost everything in this statement is wrong. And that's why I have a problem with this teaching. It doesn't match up with the scripture. It's unsound doctrine. It denigrates Christ, saying of him that he's less than he is and that he did less than he did. It says that he is less than fully king and that he did less than fully establish his kingdom on the earth, which I will demonstrate in the next lesson. So it's unsound, disagrees with scripture, as has been shown, and we will continue to uh, see from the future le lessons that this you know whole thing just doesn't work. And it's, I think it stands refuted by just what I've done today. And I find it disturbing that there are theologians and teachers in the church teaching this false doctrine. Now, if, if perhaps a lot of Christians have accepted that, it's be partly because their teachers are telling them this, uh, but you know, teachers are held to a higher standard. And of course, now that you know, I, I hope that I've inoculated you against following this this teaching. And you can check out all the scriptures that I've given you. I recommend that you go read them in their context. You know, don't, don't take it on my authority. I'm not saying these things are true because I believe them. I'm saying they're true because the scripture teaches them. Scripture says, test all things, hold fast to what is good. So go ahead and test it out. If I've made a mistake, I would want to know. So this brings us to the final question about this false teaching that says that Jesus is less than fully king now and forever, which I've debunked. Would it be a heresy? Well, I don't really know. Perhaps God has a thin black line, and if you're on this side, you're, you're good, and if you're on that side, you're a heretic, but I don't have that understanding. I don't have that view because I'm not God. I see a big gray area, you know, and I'm not quite sure where some people fall with their, their teachings and their understanding of who Christ is. And, but I do think that this certainly falls in that gray area, and I would not want to go around uh, believing and teaching things that are in the gray area. I've got to be all the way <laughs> in the green zone, so to speak. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, pronounce judgment. It's not my place, but uh, God will do that. And we just leave the, uh, leave the decision up to him. But uh, I've done uh, my part to try and uh, debunk this and get it uh, un dislodged from the church. All right. So finally, in these scriptures, we have demonstrated that Jesus is fully king now and forever, lacking nothing, having all authority. He's king of our creation. He's king of Israel. He is king of the church. He's king in every way possible. And there's only one kingdom. And we can rejoice that our Lord is king. You know, G Jody likes to start every one of these uh, worship services by saying Jesus is Lord because there are churches that won't allow you to say that. But when we say Jesus is Lord, we acknowledge his kingship. You know, at one time, it was illegal to say this, or it was considered an act of treason. In the Roman Empire, the citizens were expected to say, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is Lord. And when there were uh, Caesars who decided to persecute the church, 
they would threaten them, the Christians, that you you were expected to, in order to um, uphold Caesar as your king, you had to curse Christ and then uh, say say the, the words, Kaiser Kurios. But the Christians were saying, Yesu Kurios. Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. And some of them were tortured for this or killed. They were thrown to the lions. They were killed by gladiators. They were set on fire after being crucified by the emperor Nero. So this helps you understand the impact of Romans 10, 9, when it says, if you confess with your mouth, Iesu kurios, that's what it says in the Greek. If you confess Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. At the time that was written, those were fighting words. You know, those were words that could get you killed depending on who's Caesar and whether there is a, a program of persecution in place. So that was a dangerous thing to be saying. We take it for granted because, or most of us, because, you know, here in America, at least we live in a country where no one's persecuting you or threatening you with death or throwing you to lions if you say Jesus is Lord. But there are places probably on this planet today where you can't say that without being threatened. So we rejoice that our Lord is king and that he has all power and authority because he has power over all our enemies. He's defeated the greatest enemy that we have, death and Satan, and he is sovereign over history. So we know that we're certain to win in the end, or, or rather that we're on the winning side. <laughs> or another way to say it is our, the victory has already been won by our Lord and King, Jesus. In Revelation 19, 6, there is a, a uh, the, the voices around the throne come, or, or in heaven sing this, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. From what we've seen today, that Jesus is fully king now and forever, we can also rejo rejoice and exult. Jesus is our Lord. He is king of kings and Lord of lords now and forever. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's the point of this teaching. So next time we'll continue. And that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. And now I'd like to hear your comments and questions.